Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about the Arduino. I'm Jenny Mathiasen, an objects conservator based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservator based in Cambridgeshire. Right, welcome to this episode. And before you start freaking out, we're not just talking about the Arduino today. It's just part of what we're doing today. It's actually going to be a tech special because people want us to do another tech special. I'm still freaking out. No, that. don't. It's okay. It's safe. This is a safe space. It's a safe space and you can ask as many questions as you'd like. Everything's fine. So the Arduino is going to be part of it and we're going to talk about what that is in a little bit. Basically, this kind of came about as a kind of follow up to our Raspberry Pi or museum pie episode that we did way back in season way, one way 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 back when we put that episode out people got back to us saying that oh my god loads of the things that you were talking about would have been a much better fit for the arduino and i was like what now mm. and basically for those of you who haven't listened to the raspberry pi episode because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Chloe's face and it's a face of, what's the Raspberry Pi again? Um, I recorded the Raspberry Pi episode and I'm still like, what's what's that again? Yeah. So the Raspberry Pi is a tiny computer, probably the best way of putting it. What do you think, Christina? How do we best uh, recap what the Raspberry Pi is? Yeah, so it, it's a tiny computer that's capable of doing many of the things that, are, that your desktop computer can do. And it's designed to be as cheap and simple as possible so that people are able to use them for all kinds of projects um, hobby projects but also people use them at work yes the difference between a raspberry pi and an arduino is that they're both basically tiny computers but the arduino is a simpler one and it's what what people keep referring to as a microcontroller uh which Ooh. i know some people call it a programmable circuit board which Worse. makes <laughs> makes it also sound really <laughs> really scary and I, I think that's part of why i was like oh as soon as people brought it up because i was like i don't i don't i think that's that's less friendly right so the idea is that it's actually a much simpler computer than the raspberry pi and it's still a uh-huh. tiny tiny thing so it's still like basically the size of a pack of cards or they have some what? different ones but like they are tiny again mm. i think you may remember chloe when when we last uh, did this i showed you how little a raspberry pi was yes and yes. you and you were very impressed so yes. uh, in the same spirit of show and tell which is a terrible medium for an audio (laughs) podcast i just want to show chloe what it looks like oh my god because uh, it's funny to me so i've got a secret tray here which is covered by a towel cue striptease music (laughs) right so oh my god what this uh, i've got a contraption here that i've built at a recent workshop which we're gonna have a little review of later this is is actually It's about the size of my whole thumb, really, rather than a pack of cards. Is uh, It's mostly battery pack and those little platform things full of holes. Like, <laughs> most of it isn't the computer. <laughs> that's that's what's called breadboard, by the way. Sorry, yep. Yeah, the, no, there's no reason you would know that. That's something that you only know if you build electronics. But basically, the actual little circuit board on here is, is the computer. That's the computer. Um, oh, wow. So that's so the for, Arduino. So for people like me who don't get it, imagine, you know, those those things that we learn of as called motherboards and they're normally green. Mm-hmm. It's like that, but it's black and it's tiny. Yes. And for size comparison, here we've got the, oh, uh, thing. Here we've got the little Raspberry Pi Zero ah. that you saw last yes, time. Yes, and that is green. Yes, which is green oh. and slightly larger. Ever so slightly, but uh, like by half a centimetre. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is an Arduino. It's a tiny little thing. Do we not have a standard conservation measurement like pest traps or? Ooh, I'd say it's about a third of a pest trap. Uh, or like how many scalpel <laughs> handles long is it or oh i love that oh, but i really like the long scalpel handles. oh yeah, no, sorry, <laughs> yeah that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah. a terrible yeah. measurement it's about the size okay no i've got this i've got this it's about the size of an unopened pack of fresh scalpel blades oh good one you yeah, know yeah. the little silvery packet the swan morton ones yeah, yeah. yes <laughs> that's about the size of the arduino that i've got on my tray so yeah um, it's very good. We'll post some pictures, don't worry. <laughs> what I struggle with, I think, is the, the difference. The, in my understanding, there's a difference. There's a gap between what a computer actually is and uh-huh. my understanding of a computer. Because my understanding of a computer is that it's the interface 
Like it's the oh, I screen. See. Yes, it's what you it's do the to controls. It. Okay. Of course, it's that's not true. I mean, no, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> so telling me that's a computer, I'm like, great. What, what does that do? Where's my buttons? <laughs> yeah. But the beautiful thing is that that thing you can put some cables onto, yeah, and then that can control a button. So like that's yes. where we're at with this. Yeah. So so basically, the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi are good for slightly different things, and that's right. what people kept telling me when we'd put out the Museum Pi episode, which was really helpful. So the Arduino know is best used for simple repetitive tasks because we were talking about oh wouldn't it be great to build our own environmental loggers yes and in actual fact that's best done by an arduino because it's, it's built for simple things like that right mm. as with the raspberry pi can do much more because the raspberry pi is more of an all-purpose computer mm-hmm. in that it's got an operating system and it's easier to tell it what to do and it's much more kind of plug and play right uh, like you can just add stuff to it and it will do things so I also um, talked in that episode, I think, about a project I was attempting to do, although it didn't work out, when I was trying to run our museum touchscreens off a Raspberry Pi. Yes. And that's the kind of thing that you would want a Raspberry Pi for. Yes, exactly, right? Like the Raspberry Pi handles multiple tasks a bit better. It can run mm-hmm. several programs at once, as were the Arduino. It can do one thing really well. And so does that mean that it's more simple to work with? I mean... Why I, is it better? Yeah, see, I didn't think so initially because I was scared. Because <laughs> yeah. Permanently scared. <laughs> because I was frightened because you need to program an Arduino. Right. And I'm like, well, I'm not a programmer. There's no way I can do that. Except one of the people who got in touch with us was David. And David kindly ran a prototype workshop with us mm-hmm. uh, where he basically taught us how to use an Arduino and how to teach it to do things. And actually it was super simple. I was shocked. But we will talk about that a uh-huh. little bit later. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to read out what Arduino says it is. Is this the official website? The official website. When you Google it, it says it is an open source electronic prototyping platform. This is not enabling users to create interactive electronic objects. Yeah. Okay. That's not a great explanation. (laughs) Yeah. There's another one. There's another one. Wikipedia's. Arduino is an open source hardware and software company. You see, I I try and keep those two things very separate in my brain because I thought that's I thought software meant screens and stuff. Okay, software is the Pro- stuff that runs things. It's yeah, the but you can I I think of it as that well, you can only see it on screens. Oh, I see. But there's no screen on an Arduino because oh, it's a little lump of. There's loads of computers that don't have screens. I realise that. <laughs> for a way for you to see what the computer's doing but the computer will be doing it whether or not you have a screen so for example if you have a server that runs a website then it doesn't need a screen because you can get into that server remotely anyway from your other computer somewhere else with a screen or whatever but the computer itself the server is just like a box in a rack somewhere yes that's really unhelpful explanation i'm really sorry (laughs) But yeah, so, okay, so I think... I was just trying to come up with an example of a computer that doesn't have a screen, which Chloe would have come across possibly. This this goes back to my... (laughs) Yeah, so this comes back to my issue with um, what a computer is and what my understanding of a computer is from a usability point of view. Yes, no, that's fine. And this is a very, very, like, basic... I can understand it from an academic level, from a sort of emotional how I think about the world level. A computer has to have a screen and a keyboard, right? We shouldn't dwell too much on my lack of understanding of the world because we could be here forever. So I will just read out the Wikipedia entry just because it seems to be a little bit more open. Arduino is an open source hardware and software company, project and user community that designs and manufactures single board micro microcontrollers and and microcontroller kits for building digital devices. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So digital y- devices, I like. Okay. That. So think of it uh, as kit building then. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I like. That. That's fine. That's fine. As long as you're happy. That's great. <laughs> Chloe, did you not have to do electronics at school? Not even a little bit. Oh, really? I I was taught about, yeah, I was taught about a plug. I could probably rewire a plug if I had a diagram in front of me. Oh, okay. Because I I did GCSE technology and part of that was doing electronics. I did not. Oh, interesting. So you haven't ever sort of had to make as a, like, for example, in, I don't know, year eight or something, I had to make a bath level water sensor. And I had to wire up how to make a little light bulb light up. Which was, is basically, it's a simple circuit. Oh, Mm. 
in physics. Yeah, exactly, that kind of thing. And it's a simple circuit where you kind of solder your sensors onto a circuit board, onto a or, or put them in a breadboard, as Jenny says, mm. and then the water completes your circuit when it reaches a certain level and a buzzer goes off or whatever. And So I think we did some... We did things, but it was more from a messing about with electricity kind of level. So we did circuits okay, and we did well, all of that. But from a technology point of view, I did... Oh, what was my GCSE? I did, I did textiles. So all of this is like... I can tell you how to put a zip, guys. But... <laughs> I mean, I wish I could knew how to do that, to be honest. You can make awesome costumes. Yes, <laughs> so actually you win it. I mean, the electronics were kind of very basic at school mm-hmm. for me, but uh, it did just cover things like how to make a circuit and that sort of thing. Like it wasn't super involved. Um, yes. Which, you know, might be the kind of stage where loads of us are at, where Mm -hmm. actually we don't know that much about this. Like, we're not massive nerds and we we don't (laughs) build things like this, you know, in kit format very often. But I guess what I'm saying is that these things exist. And actually, once you get stuck in, it's not actually as frightening as it seemed at first. I think the Raspberry Pi has been better at marketing itself as towards kids and Mm -hmm. also being like, this is a really friendly, good way of starting. Mm -hmm. Cute name, etc. Which is also why we why we covered that, because Mm -hmm. it wasn't easy to start with kind of thing. Now in some ways the Arduino is actually more simplistic in that you just kind of tell it a thing to do and there are there's a very Mm -hmm. specific way of doing that. But even though it is technically simpler, it's also more technical, which makes it kind of grown-up version yeah so Um, i suppose one of the things we could say could we could be trying to do in this episode is to join up the the value that we all feel into how in what something can do mm. and connect that with how something works and sort of try and demystify the join between those two i mean i i hope so i hope so i hope we can and that's that's where i really wanted to um say that this workshop i went to was absolutely great at demystifying and making it less scary so in fact let's listen to that now Oh, this is exciting stuff. So we're in Queen Mary University where we're about to embark on an adventure with Dr. David Mills. Um, And we're going to learn a bit about building Arduino loggers. I'm very excited. I'm also tired because it's morning and the coffee hasn't quite kicked in yet. But I'm sure this will be fine. It'll be lovely. And I'll be recording snippets of our progress and tweeting some stuff. And I'm sure it'll be exciting. Let's see what we can build. I've had the idea for doing these sort of things for at least four or five years now. The plan is really, for these ones, simple to build, basically plug things together. Uh, no, or absolutely minimal soldering. There's no soldering in this one today. Uh, cheap, these can be built for less than £30. Uh, run for at least three months on three AA batteries and requires no special software cables, anything to access the data. Outline for today is going to be a very quick introduction to electronics, a very quick introduction to programming, and we get to, well, playtime is kind of in between these, so we'll, we'll, and we'll build and test the logger. Right, so we've just had the workshop. Uh, in a little bit, I'm going to talk quickly to David before we go, but basically, it's been a great day. It's uh, been really interesting to tinker with these things. And I feel like the Arduino is so much less scary now. I feel like basically this workshop like, really took some of the really scary elements out of it. And it's been great to see that you can build your own environmental logger. This thing that I've actually gotten to take with me, which is grand, it will, do, it will record you... Um, temperature and relative humidity at any interval that you want if you want it every 10 seconds you can have it every 10 seconds if you want it every half hour you can do that it's just been super duper to see the thing and actually we got to program it like i can change things and i can make it do things that i want i can name it useful things the current one is not very useful in named cats and foxes but like you could name it like bronze age case or i don't know early history gallery or whatever you needed it to be yeah i've got loads of thoughts but that's just just my initial reaction is just that this has been a really great workshop and i cannot wait for other nerds out there to have a chance at doing this basically it's been great right let's go find david right so we've just finished your amazing workshop i'm here with dr david mills thanks so much for having us today it's been really great would you like to tell us a little bit about why why you've dragged us here on a saturday morning no uh, why you've decided to do this (laughs) 
So it, it's been... I've always had an interest in just recording as much about the world as is possible. And as I seem to be tangentially around conservators and archives and taught science at Camberwell College... Because you're a physicist, don't you? Yeah, I'm a physicist by yeah. training and always had a passion for electronics. I, I built my first radio at age five or something. So I've been doing it, stuff like that. It seemed there was a need for a cheapish and easy to build temperature, humidity otherwise extensible data logger Mm -hmm. there was a project a few years ago where somebody built one using arduinos but they're not particularly low power devices you can only log for about a week on a set of batteries so i decided i was going to build something that would work for longer be configurable just more user friendly and fun to build Uh did did i succeed i think you did actually (laughs) thank you (laughs) i look forward to experimenting with it and like seeing what else i can make it do Yes, send me some ideas, things you would like it to do. I yeah, can send absolutely. you kits of parts and places to put them in and we'll test them. You, you heard the man, anyone out there who has some ideas, yeah. that would be great. So you're hoping to run these workshops, presumably, at yes. some point? Yes, so once I get the feedback from this one, fix a few issues, I will be trying to run these and get people building temperature and humidity data loggers. That's fabulous, because it's been a really, really fun day, I have to say. Good. Um, and yes, so uh, hopefully we can help you promote these workshops when you, when you do start doing them. Because Please, uh, please do. I'm hoping um, towards the end of this year, everything will be ready and up and running. This was the pilot to work out the bugs and fix issues. So Yeah, excellent. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, David. Thank you for coming along. Right, so I think I'm getting more of an idea of how this works and how we might be able to use it now. Oh, good, I'm glad. That's good. Right, so basically, you can get so many different kinds of sensors with these things that all sound like they would be really, really useful. I mean, obviously, the the ones that we did in the workshop were ones that check temperature and humidity. And that's obvious for us that, like, yeah, that's really useful because then mm-hmm. we can make loggers. Obviously, my first question in the workshop was, can I make ones that do light? Because they're really expensive to buy light mm-hmm. monitors. <laughs> uh, mm. Could I make those? And actually, yes. But he said he didn't know how reliable they were in terms of calibration and stuff oh, at this point. Just because he hasn't tested them. Mm-hmm. So that, that's not to say that they're unreliable. It's just he doesn't know, mm-hmm. which is fine. Someone out there might know. And if you do, please write in. You can get things like gyro gyroscopes and accelerometers which means that you can make like bump monitors for things that you send out right that's amazing and i mean yes i know that Mm. you can buy them but i don't know how much they are and if you can build one for potentially less like say 30 quid then Mm -hmm. (laughs) i would you can get things like dust monitors infrared air quality and gas stuff so if you say building a fume hood or something then you could have that to let you know how many like uh, volatile organic Mm -hmm. compounds are uh, in the air and stuff like that I mean I just think there are so many possibilities Mm -hmm. just and that's just for loggers right for like monitors people do a lot more with the Arduino than just that it's just that seems most conservation-y to me the most on the ground useful to people yeah i just i just think there are like loads of fun things that we can do here as conservators and yes i get that it did like the threshold to like getting into this might be a little bit higher in terms of it's scary Mm -hmm. but actually financially they're actually pretty cheap like they're on par with what what we were talking about the prices for like the raspberry pi stuff having a brief look around like official arduino boards are from anywhere between nine pounds and 30 pounds and then you get some loggers and stuff on top of that but they're like a couple of quid each the loggers like the the actual little monitors the sensors uh, the the sensor bits like they're only a couple of quid each and that sort of thing so you could actually buy like Mm -hmm. uh, buy these and make them for not very much money and i mean Yes, I know that if you have no budget at all than spending 50 quid on this project and a bit of time, that might still be too much. However, if it's that or buying one for £500 pounds <laughs> from, from a supplier, then you know what? That's a, an easy trade-off in my book. But I, I get that that's not for everyone. But I really hope it's for someone out there. I think I would want to know how well calibrated the sensors are. Um, yes, obviously that's a big thing. And Possibly it's not actually too big an issue because if they're, I don't know, 1% out for RH, for example, 
then it still gives you the general trends doesn't it she is conservatist that's really what we ought to be looking at yes. rather than oh my god it's gone one degree over whatever we did actually talk about this in the workshop as well because we did ask well how do you calibrate these things it's not like there's a manufacturer mm. you can send them off to and have them mm-hmm. calibrated and as i recall the answer was well you just make a slurry of salt and water in a bag pop them in for a bit yeah Yeah. pop them in for a bit and they are calibrated after that like that sort of thing right so it's there are low budget ways of calibrating these things once you've made them to be fair that's how the posh monitors are calibrated no exactly right it's not actually that different so i mean that doesn't necessarily solve the accuracy they might be out by accuracy anyway but in actual fact if you've got uh, let's say that you're building some of these and you've got one of your posh monitors that's calibrated and you know is accurate you can use that as your standard because what you can do is you can go into the basically program that you've written for these for these loggers and compare what they're recording to what you can see on your calibrated logger maybe a handheld one or something and then adjust and say actually it's 0.5 out and then it will record it with 0.5 taken into account so you'll actually get the accurate reading i guess you you said go into the program that you've written for one of these loggers. Yes. And I guess that, that is also the value you get from the off-the-shelf uh, systems is that... You don't have to with mess with that at all. package of software that allows you to analyse your data very easily. Ah, but it's not so actually about the analysing stuff. I mean, yeah, sure. Yes, you'll get the graph automatically. As we're in this, you'd import it into Excel and make a graph by pushing a button in Excel. So, yes, like it's not fancier than that you still have to do the push one button to get the to get the graph i don't know i think i mean the system we had could text people when the conditions were outside certain parameters which was technically that's just another couple of lines of code actually it can do that so yes (laughs) I get that. And actually, I, I disagree with you about it being the equivalent of just pushing a button and getting a graph. Yes, you can do that in Excel, but the software I've used was a lot more sophisticated than that and allowed you to overlay graphs from different periods or from different galleries and that sort of thing or to look simultaneously at the conditions in different areas oh yeah like this this, so, this is never going to replace something that's really high end of course exactly but obviously that comes at a cost so i'm not yes. disagreeing with you but i'm just saying I, oh, yeah. I don't think we should oversell this either <laughs> oh no, no 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 obviously this is a lot of faff and you're your own tech support with these right so um so it it, it, it won't work for everyone certainly but i would love to see people play about with it more Um, So I'm getting the impression that with the Raspberry Pi and with Arduino and stuff and just having my eyes open in the world Mm -hmm. generally, that there's a huge movement of tech advances that the museum world is kind of spreading its feelers into. And we're getting we're making some really interesting steps. Yeah, I I think the interest in these as solutions for museum specific problems probably is for two reasons, actually. And one is cost. Mm -hmm. Like Jenny said, museums are probably brain rich and cash poor if you see what I mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean museums are stuffed full of intelligent, creative, inventive people and they often have to operate on a shoestring. So this is a really good low cost way of being able to do the things you want to do in your museum without having to invest a load of money. And I think the other reason for this is that we're minnows if you like, in the big pond of life. <laughs> That's a terrible metaphor. Oh, my God. Um, we're museums. Museums are really small, and often we have very, very specific problems yes. um, that other people just aren't interested in solving commercially yeah. because there are going to be so few people who are going to want to buy that product. Yeah, it's, um, it's not a I great mean, we're, business we're, model. We're quite lucky. Yeah, exactly. We're quite lucky in a way that we are able to buy off-the-shelf environmental monitoring systems, but that is only because they are already in use for things like food storage and transport facilities which is many 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 times bigger business than Mm. museums are for example so people are already making these things and there's loads of things we might want to do in museums to do with storage and display and environment and so on where the solutions don't exist already and so if you want to solve these sorts of problems you have to make 
your own solutions. So I wonder if part of the interest in this is partly driven by cost and partly driven by a lack of availability of alternatives. I think you're right. And I was going to say, so some of the people who got in touch with us after we did the Raspberry Pi episode, first of all, shout out to Sharon and Ron in Israel, because they wrote in and said that they were using the Arduino to do environmental monitoring in one of their museums, which is fantastic to hear about. And also shout out to Sasha in America, who got in touch saying that to say that they solve problems in, in their museum about uh, things like uh, time-based media and like things that need to keep running, but the original technology is now obsolete or doesn't work. So it's kind mm. of a way of mm-hmm. keeping things going. And that's how I've seen a lot of people pitch this because I've been looking around the internet for various kinds of um, ideas where people have been using Arduinos in a museum setting. And unsurprisingly, a lot of it is around exhibitions and building interactives Mm -hmm. uh, or fixing old broken interactives. That seems to be a really key element Mm -hmm. where it's like, we used to have a button that worked here, it doesn't work anymore. What can we do now? Because... No one is mm, around who built to this. this. Yeah, <laughs> like it needs to somehow fit in this contraption that was originally there, but we don't know how to fix this. There, no one left any documentation. What can we do? And some clever people are getting into these machines or weird boards and galleries and all that stuff and replacing the bits and the functionality with stuff that's run on an Arduino. Because a lot of the time is push a button, something happens. And that's a really easy thing to do with an Arduino because it can do all of those things. So I found a project called Muse Duino. Oh yes, I saw but that. I don't one. know if they're still in operation, but they um, describe them. It, they describe Muse Duino, um, which is obviously like Museum Arduino, uh, as an electronic exhibit development kit. Yes. So the idea is to allow you to develop these sorts of exhibits that Jenny was talking about using an Arduino. And I guess one of the issues is that often these are one-offs. I mean, the selling point for your museum is that you don't have the same kind of interactive display or exhibit as everyone else. Yours is just specific to your museum. So when it breaks, yeah, you are probably going to have to kind of MacGyver it a bit and Yeah, so it seems like in museums, the Arduino is mostly used for things like either fixing or creating brand new exhibition interactors, which are great, great ways of using them. Let's be fair. Uh, Something else I saw was someone had built a custom-built weather station for Canada Aviation and Space Museum, which I thought was kind of cute. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Which is lovely. People apparently build weather stations all the time because people are obsessed with weather. I don't know. I don't know what the appeal is of a weather station. Um, <laughs> but this seems to be... A- I got a weather station for my birthday last year. Oh, my God. You are so cute. I like. I asked for a weather station. You are for my so birthday. cute. Why? 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 <laughs> I'm British, so it's in my I was DNA gonna say, to be obsessed you're by the weather. Partly because I'm middle-aged now, and and partly because it means I can see what the temperature is outside without moving off the sofa. That's fair. Partly because it's kind of mildly interesting when everybody's moaning about, God, it's hot today, isn't it really hot? And then you can have a look and go, yes, it is. It's 36 degrees inside. <laughs> so I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. Right, speaking of things that you can do with Arduinos, let's listen to an interview with Mark. Oh, hi there. Good morning. Um, I'm Mark Heller, and um, I've been uh, running my own consultancy for the past 10 years. And um, the work I do is I've been working with museums, uh, primarily SFMOMA, and uh, I've also done work at the Guggenheim and the Smithsonian on the conservation and care of software-based artworks. Um, Now, that doesn't take all my time, so I also teach two art colleges here in San Francisco on the topic of uh, electronics and programming and um, microcontrollers in an artful context. So um, actually, it was Sasha who put me in touch with you and said that you had used the Arduino in interesting conservation formats. And I was just kind of curious about how did that come to be and what have you been doing? Oh, well, you know, the Arduino, it's it's a very popular microcontroller and it's accessible. That's one of the goals of the Arduino project was to bring electronic engineering into the realm of artists and designers. So uh, one of the larger projects I've done in recent time was there was a pretty significant sculpture in the a museum's collection that was a uh, neon piece that was sequenced. So there's about five or six neon words. 
and it was driven by a um, a lighting sequencer, a lighting sequencer you might use for stage lighting that was built in the 70s. And oh, wow. um, yeah, so right these days you have a, a lighting control protocol called DMX or digital multiplexing. Back in the 70s, they didn't have that standard. So it would it would just be like a, a automated sort of switch or time switch that would turn these neon lights on by sending 12 volts or not 12 volts in a, in a sequence timed fashion. And anyways, it was this complex electronic device for the 70s, but it just burned out and the company had gone out of business long ago. Mm. So so the conservator's like, well, Mark, can't we use an Arduino for this? Because um, I had been doing a lot of lighting projects for my own work. And I was like, yes, we can use an Arduino. So we had to do some electronics. You know, Arduino switches five volts, which is a low voltage, and it's known as logic level voltage. Uh, so we made some electronics where the five volts would switch higher voltages, in this case, 12. And um, so we rigged all the electronics and tested it. And the media conserver actually took on the task of programming it because she thought it was intriguing and fun. And again, Arduino is quite accessible. So we were able to measure the original timings through some video documentation. Oh, yeah. I was, and, uh, I was curious if the original unit had burned out, how you were going to recreate that. But that makes sense that you had video of it. Yeah, well, it was a pretty, it's a pretty significant piece by a pr- very popular artist. So there was uh, fortunately a lot of video documentation in the oh, work. Um, before the the equipment burnout, so so that that was uh, we were in good shape there. But remember to take good video documentation, <laughs> yeah, of, of any timed automated works, um, so you can have some reference points. Yeah. So that's I'm glad that sounds like that was a, a real success that that worked out well. Yeah, I was in. in Technically, it was quite um, achievable. It was just, it was a really high profile artwork. So I was like freaking out a little bit. I was like, (laughs) I don't know if we could just put an Arduino on it, but it actually, it it was a perfect case for it. Uh, Do you have any other examples? Yeah, there was a, there was a museum in New York um, and they had a piece that was, it was, it was stepper motors. Um, It was, so a stepper motor is a very precise motor that moves in, uh, you know, uh, steps and they're used in 3d printers and printers and, uh, copy machines, anything you need really precise motion. Mm. And this particular piece had seven, um, stepper motors, huge ones. It might be from like, a uh, an industrial, uh, automation facility and they drove turntables um not turntables like you'd play a record on but big metal turntables okay and on these and there were seven of them and on these turntables were projectors and uh i think on the first five were um video projectors and they were old video projectors they they were composite video projectors from the 90s and um on the top two of the platform were slide projectors. And what the piece was, was, well, it, it, the stepper motors were synchronized with the video and it was in this dark room and there were all these people sort of running around in a choreography of movement. And, you know, a projector just would point at a wall typically, but since they were on turntables, uh, these people would be walking all over the room because the turntables would move the projectors. Yeah, sure. And then interestingly, on the top two platforms were slide projectors. It was a certain type of Kodak slide projector, and I, I don't remember the exact model number. But when Kodak, you know, when projectors were coming out, sometime in the 90s, Kodak wanted to be relevant. And so they had uh, computer-controlled slide projectors that you would plug in a serial port cable to a computer. And then you you could send commands to the projector to um, advance the slide or jump to a, a certain slide number or brighten the bulb or dim the bulb. Anyways, um, so all of this, all these electronics, the stepper motors and the um, uh, the laser disc players at the time that would play the video that went to the projectors, 
um, and and the slide projectors were all controlled by a 486 computer running the DOS operating system. Oh gosh! So there was a big gaggle of wires running to all the um, electronics. So, anyways, th- this museum had asked me. They're like, "Oh, you know, we let's let's get it running." You know, the artist had passed away, and this will be a big conservation project. And oh, I was, you know, I was like, "All right, let's do it." And um, so I was able to uh, uh, take a, a, a kind of a, a, a. It was called an Arduino Due. It's a 32-bit Arduino. Uh, the standard Arduino is 8-bit, but it's a lot more powerful. And I was able to, after a lot of testing, uh, I was able to eventually drive the stepper motors. Yeah, and I could drive all um, seven of them off one Arduino Due. It has a lot more pins in a regular Arduino. Oh, I see. It was a lot of work. Now we didn't. Now there was no documentation in this case, since the work was last installed in like '94, and there just wasn't a lot of good documentation. Ooh, yeah. uh, so what we did in that case was we used a logic analyzer, which is a piece of test equipment. And um, when you control a, a stepper motor, you send a series of electronic pulses to it, and the electronic pulses look like a square wave and the denser the square wave, the faster the stepper motors are going to move. Ah, so that's how you could figure it out. Yeah. The slower a square wave, you know, it it correlates to speed. So a logic analyzer is a piece of test equipment and you can see it's like a microscope for digital signals. And that allowed us to take um, a readings of what was coming out of the 486 computer so we could take readings. I mean, there's still some challenges to it because if you take readings over an hour, it's a huge amount of data, of huge course, amount yeah. of data. Um, so we had to come up with some strategies. But but that worked. And then we were able to um, control the stepper motors with an Arduino that talked to a, a Mac Mini. The Mac Mini, we wrote software. Uh, uh, we wrote software-based um, synchronized video players. And then we had a, a sort of a custom software on the Mac mini that sequenced everything. So, uh, but the Arduino is key in that. And then also, um, you know, the serial port or the RS-232 port uh, that we had on computers in the nineties and eighties. Well, you, that, that, that talks over a, a protocol called serial communications protocol. And that's what Arduino uses today. They use it over USB an old protocol, but quite standard. But you can get an RS-232 adapter for an Arduino and send commands to older devices like laser disks. And um, Oh, that uh, is useful. Oh, yeah, it's quite useful. Um, there's a, and there are a lot of serial uh, RS-232-enabled devices in the 80s and 90s, like video switchers. Um, a lot of uh, video decks have RS-232 projectors. A lot of devices, so you, it's actually really great because if you can get the the manual and find the commands that you can issue to a device like a, a video deck or something, or a laser disc was a big one, um, you can plug an Arduino and program it, and in a timed fashion, send those commands. So, for example, Gary Hill, Tall Ships, uh, very early... Uh, interactive video artwork where you would walk down a hallway and there were laser disc players with projectors. And as you walk down the hallway, a, a series of sensors would know that you're there and then it would play a video of people walking up to you. And those were using laser discs that had sensors that would trigger a video clip using RS-232 on a laser disc. Yeah, so if that ever broke, you could use an Arduino. Hey, that's amazing. Yes, yes. Well, it sounds like you can do some really amazing things with these, with this sort of tech in, you know, in conservation, which is really nice to know. Yeah, actually, a side note, last year, the uh, Smithsonian Conservation Lab had invited me to teach a workshop on oh, wow. uh, a two-day workshop for mi- programming microcontrollers and Arduinos uh, for conservation. So that worked out pretty well. So there's a lot of applications, and they're actually getting works that have Arduinos in them. Are you going to run any more workshops, do you think? Oh, I don't. Well, you know, I teach, but always happy to do summer workshops. So. Excellent. Glad yes. to hear it. So that might be an option for our conservators in North America. Uh, if anyone has any questions or want to pick your brain about a project, is there a way of getting in touch with you? Oh, sure. You can email me. Uh, my email is uh, mark, M A R K, at heller, H E L L A R, studios.com. 
You can also hang out with me on Instagram at instagram.com forward slash M Heller, M H E L L A R, and see some of the work I've been doing. Are you on Twitter at all? I am on Twitter. Uh, it's M-, M Heller, M H E L L A R. Pop links to those in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for talking to us, Mark. Oh, well, thank you. I just want to throw in very, very quickly because I've no, my other half has dabbled with creating a virtual assistant, but an open source one. So, Chloe, you were talking about open mm. source. And, um, uh huh. <laughs> Blankly. And, and open source means that it's not owned by a company, it's not run by a company. Anyone can add to it, anyone can use it. Oh, it's, right. It's like uh, a Creative Commons equivalent, basically, uh-huh. but for, um, before code and oh, okay. programs and stuff like that. I mean, I have a list here labelled stupid questions. There are no what stupid are questions. What are virtual assistants? Ah, yes. So, you know how uh, people have on their phones, for example, Siri, or in their homes, they might have right. Alexa. Yeah. Apologies if I just inadvertently you triggered it. Woke, up, woke up your virtual assistant by going, <laughs> Alexa. I'm sorry. Similarly, Alexa, play the C word. <laughs> yes. Alexa, give the C word five stars on iTunes. I'm keeping that in the episode. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, and you know how you can ask Google things, for example. Yes. Hey, Google, what's, uh-huh. what's yeah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. I think Microsoft has one as well, but no one uses that. So, yeah. So the, these are the, that's what we uh, talk right. about when we talk about virtual assistants. So they're they're a big thing now. Like mm-hmm. people have them in their yeah, homes. They, yeah, they tie into I've smart. I've got one. I just didn't think of it things. like that. And there's uh, various open sourced initiatives so that you don't have to buy one from Google, etc. And they're not like perfect at this point. But one's called Mycroft. We were playing around with it, and I said, "Oh, I wonder if it would be a good thing to have in a lab setting, like to have a virtual assistant for the lab." But I guess in my head, I'm slightly wondering, what do people actually use virtual assistants for? Because I love how sci-fi it is to have a lab assistant that's a virtual assistant. But why would I actually need one? Because what do people use them for? It's when people can't be bothered typing, which is admittedly a lot of the time because I'm holding something so together. So my partner uses them when he's cooking. He'll be looking at a recipe that, and it'll be an American recipe or an old, re- old recipe. Oh, and he'll right. need What's to transfer this in, in grams, grams or something. Okay. And so he'll, because he's like got like oily or flowery hands yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So he'll go... Okay, Google. I feel like as as people Sorry, who are Rob. often gloved up or in the middle of doing something, it, that's exactly we can relate what I'm to that. Thinking. Yeah, so I think you could say, "Okay, Google is Clusol G soluble in acetone." That would be great. That would be fantastic. But it would be pretty niche because a Extremely lot of that stuff niche. isn't necessarily Googleable because it's all no. locked away in our special books that cost hundreds of pounds. <laughs> so I feel like there is potential there for some knowledge extraction uh-huh. when you can't go and get the book that you need to look in. I don't know though. I mean, isn't this the kind of information you would get before you <laughs> got stuck into something? This is my problem, right? As soon as I start thinking about these things, I'm like, but I'm fine now. <laughs> That's the problem. I'm on the fence. <laughs> so I really like new technology, but at the same time, I'm quite slow to understand digital trends. I, I just remembered this would have been in 2010. I was pregnant with my first child and I went to a gig with a friend and he brought an iPad <laughs> Um, and it was the first time I'd seen an iPad because they'd just been introduced to the UK and I was like what the f*** is that what's the point of that (laughs) I've just got a smartphone but I completely failed to understand how this would get adopted um, yeah why people would want tablets i'm not the person to ask about virtual assistants for conservation <laughs> and also i don't use alexa or okay google or google so my other half will quite often like shout questions at google for example because he's busy like doing something else he's a sculptor so he will be literally doing something else so he he can't but he's curious and impulsive <laughs> in that he wants to know the answer immediately <laughs> not in 10 minutes when he's done <laughs> I think, like, curious is a great characteristic for a conservator. Impulsive, possibly not so much. So <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> that might be the answer. <laughs> so I asked some friends who do use these quite regularly. So what do you use, like, your mm-hmm. virtual assistants for? And the answer tended to be like, oh, it's to set me a reminder. And I'm like, well, I've got a paper calendar for yeah. that. Or it's to uh, write me a shopping list. And I'm like, well, I've got paper. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I can usually find a pen. Seeing a pattern here. And it annoys me because I really want to be on board and I want to find a use for this. And please, if you're out there, you can think of something clever. Like, let me know. But I just can't think of anything that I particularly needed to do that won't just result in me being 
rubbish at planning or get lazy <laughs> because that's not really what I want to do. If it's more effective use of time, I'm on board. If it's I can't be bothered writing anything ever again, then that's not good because I like pen and paper. <laughs> See, I've got a, um, probably going to mess up this anecdote now, but it's just a, a silly quote that my partner used when we were talking, when I was complaining about technology in a totally unrelated uh, okay. conversation around a dinner table with my parents the other day. Well, didn't Plato say we should never write anything down because then we'd never be able to remember anything again? Oh, and I feel like that's quite a nice sort of yeah. The bottom line is though that everybody's complained about any sort of progression <laughs> because it will damage the way things are now. I mean, <laughs> yeah, fine, but Jenny's shopping lists on paper are still going to exist possibly in a hundred years, depending on your attitude to archiving and recycling. Obviously, but you know, and they may well be of interest to people. People's random shouts out to Alexa or whatever are not going to exist. Oh, oh, but the, but no, that's a, that's an interesting point from a like preservation angle. That's kind of cute that we're yeah, now yeah. talking about that. That's that's sweet, right? That was I, I think that was rant over. Like I really mm-hmm. want to be on board, but I'm on the fence about whether we actually need this. I, I have complicated emotions. I'm intrigued from a distance. <laughs> I'm happy to wait and see what other people will do with technology. Gen- generally, really, yeah, other people will do it. Yeah. Anyway, so I think. We're all slightly sceptical about this kind of thing and about, you know, finding a use for this kind of technology in the future. But I recently spoke to Bav Shah, who's a scientist at the VNA, and he's one of the most optimistic and enthusiastic people about future technologies I've ever spoken to. So have a listen to this. My name is Bav Shah. I'm a scientist at the Victoria and Albert Museum. I've been at the VNA for 12 years now. Uh, I'm a chemist, so I did a chemistry degree, and my previous jobs have just been in industry. So I was working in pharmaceuticals, uh, working in dairy, just doing really random jobs. And before I started at the VNA, I was working as a, a lab assistant in a Royal Free Hospital. So that's quite varied. So how did you come to find out about conservation and the job at the VNA? Oh, well, I was, I was doing some charity work for a local historic house. You know, just seen behind the scenes, it was really interesting, looked really, you know, exciting. And I saw a job come up at the VNA, advertising new scientists, and I thought, you know, why not? Let's just give it a go. Cool. It's kind of married some of my skills from university and, you know, just went for an interview and got the job. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so I do mostly environmental monitoring. So I look after the system at the VNA that measures the temperature, humidity, light done a bit of dust monitoring before, mm-hmm. uh, done a bit of dust analysis, a bit of pollutants, and generally just collections care work and looking at, you know, making sure things aren't being damaged because of the environment. Okay. So the reason I'm talking to you today is because we got talking to each other at the Icon Belfast conference, and you were telling me about some quite cool things that you've been doing with computing, which I think is quite a bit different from what most people think about when they think about scientists in museums. How did that come about? Oh, yeah, uh, e- e- easy one. I think I'm a bit of a geek at heart. <laughs> You know, I've just always had, you know, teaching, I guess teaching yourself coding and just bits and pieces. And I think it was a Raspberry Pi. So I've listened to your previous podcast on the Raspberry Pi. All right, cool. <laughs> um, Mark Kearney, he was studying at the time and he was in the lab. Yeah. He was working on this really great project, videoing a bag degrade in real time using a Raspberry Pi. And we just had real good fun with it and mm-hmm. never really looked back since. I think I think I have every Raspberry Pi since it's come out, which is a bit of a sad <laughs> Trivial fact. <laughs> <laughs> so after you'd seen Mark's project, what you were just thinking, well, what else can I do with this? Yeah, and I, I've always thought like, you know, the computer's always going faster or more high tech or, you know, more processing power and this, that and the other. <laughs> and the Raspberry Pi had a, a different approach to it. It said, you know, l- learn to code, um, like learn the principles of coding and it doesn't really matter how fast your computer is. That's, that's my interpretation of it. Mm-hmm. And it was just a really... It's just really good fun. It's, there's loads of groups you can meet up with and, you know, loads of scripts online. Wow. There's, you know, just a huge cult following of it, really. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very community-based. I think they're quite big, aren't they, on encouraging people who haven't necessarily had experience of coding to just give it a go and pick their own project in a way and find something they want to do. And then it seems like there's a lot of support out there. Yeah. And so, for example, I was a recent project I worked on, I think I blogged about it on the VNA website, is... Um, 
uh, we had a student from Portugal, Maria Inesh Carvela, and she was we were working on a, I think we called it a security camera for insects, you know, so mm-hmm. we would get a really small Raspberry Pi, put a camera on and just get it to record anything that walked underneath it. So it's what, motion triggered? Yeah, motion triggered. So I think it's just it, the, way, the way the software works. We, we, I, I was following a developer in the States and he, he, he just said, yeah, go ahead, use my code. And it was just such a, just a great thing for... You know, connecting with people all the way in America, and you know, and he, and it, and it basically just takes an image every now and then, and if it sees anything different, it will save it. It's, it's very simple. And what were you hoping to do with the data from that? Uh, it was just to see if we could do it, basically. <laughs> yep, fair enough. And and oh, and and also the idea was if if it does start capturing pictures of in- insects, we'd have a database of images of insects, mm-hmm. and using that database, you could start developing a machine learning algorithm to. You know, you can start teaching itself to actually identify them and ID them. Right, okay. So that, that was part two of the project, but we never really got anywhere close to, you know, it, it really became three months of just fiddling around with the Raspberry Pi and, you know, getting mm-hmm. it to work, really. So how far did you get? Um, we've got it to work. I'm not going to say it's it's going to replace the bug trap yet. <laughs> the bug trap is the, <laughs> the sticky board manufacturers are still safe. Um, it it it's very light dependent. It's, you know, the insects tend to move when it's dark, so you just get tend to end up with blurry images. But the low light software part of it is very good, but it then means you have to have longer exposures. Yeah. So the insects are gone already. Yeah, you know, I guess they don't thing. stay obligingly still, <laughs> so you can get a long exposure don't, photo. They don't pose, no, don't they? No. <laughs> um, were you finding you were getting different insects if you could identify them from the ones that you were catching in your traps no we, we, we only ever really captured one insect and it was a bit of um, a fuzzy image and we didn't really idea it. but um it was the power that really was the issue we couldn't get a power supply mm. that kept it going for long enough we just found it you know it had just fallen asleep by the time we got back to it and it was you know <laughs> it powered down over the night and it, it, it was it was really the batteries and power that were the real stumbling block yeah. with it. But it was, you know, potentially it was good if you got, if you got it plugged in, you know, it could work. Yeah. And so the part two of that, it sounds like you didn't quite get round to that, but you had an idea that you could train the computer on all of the images you got to recognise what are the distinctive features of each type of insect and then start IDing them for you automatically. Is that the idea? Yeah, and that somebody will do that eventually. Then that is... It's a real doable task now, I think, with um, all you need with images is is a certain amount of them. So if you have, you know, a a training set of 50,000 images, let's say, or 100,000, you can really get the machine learning algorithms to actually start, you know, they create their convolutional networks, then, you know, they learn by themselves, so they're not... I guess it's still a pretty hands-on process. You still have to know quite a a fair bit of coding, but there's new stuff coming out all the time. The data available now is incredible, and the, you know, so I, th- I think there's something. There's a stat out at the moment. There's something every three months more images are taken and uploaded than have ever been photographed in the whole history of, you know. So it's a it's an amazing wealth of data to be mined, basically. Yeah. So there's precedent for this in other fields, um, in that this kind of automated image recognition and processing is used in medical fields for example yeah. they trained computers to recognize potentially worrying features on scans and that sort of thing so i guess maybe it'll be that museums can borrow some of this expertise eventually definitely definitely i think medical they they're really leading in the field and mm. medical and um the, the, the googles and the facebooks are really really leading they're trying to i guess eventually they'll i mean they probably do branch out into other fields and i think museums are definitely an area where they're there's huge interest, I think, I see. So do you think the limitation here would be money or time or expertise or willpower? Or I guess I guess there's kind of a fear with machine learning and AI. Yeah. I think there's possibly not an understanding of what it is and what it does. You know, the, the fear is these machines will start learning by themselves and develop this intelligence, but they're not. They're just... I think that's a very far away step. I don't think anyone's ever really got close to ever teaching a machine to teach itself to do anything. All it is essentially is a pattern recognition algorithm that teaches itself to detect patterns, which is very different to lateral thinking. Yeah. So, you know, even if you set an algorithm to learn how to make people happy and it comes up with a conclusion, you know, kill all humans, (laughs) it it won't necessarily 
have the lateral thinking enough to, you know, go away and do that. <laughs> well, okay, that's a really which, which is good, which yeah. is good. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think there are other areas of conservation specifically, um, but also museum practice more broadly, where we could use this kind of machine learning? Definitely. Like, So the applications are endless with it. I think... Uh, like, like the way the internet was created, the world is being plumbed at the moment. I think there's a lot of plumbing going on with data mm. so that they can be fed into machine learning algorithms. I think this is happening at, behind the scenes on a, you know, a huge scale at the moment. But um, it would be the defining era of the next 10 years, I think. If the internet was the last 10 years and going mobile and having mobile phone technology, the next 10, 20 years will be defined by machine learning and having this data plumbed into you know huge learning algorithms but the but the applications to museums is is enormous so you've got you've got image data from objects you've got um scientific data from analysis the environmental data i collect you've got anything visual or anything anything that can turn into a number is going to be eventually plumbed into some system Mm. and that's probably the reality of it and the, the outputs will be Possibly quite spectacular. Like it would be interesting because these algorithms can see in dimensions we can't see. So, you know, you, you move away from three-dimensional analysis to you know multi, multi-dimensional analysis, which is a bit confusing. But it's a bit, and you can analyze things in ways you just couldn't before. Yeah. Which would be interesting. It, it was in its. This technology is really is in its nappies, really. <laughs> yeah. So. I guess the the advantage of these sorts of machines is that sometimes they can see patterns in the data that are statistically significant, but that we don't recognise as actual patterns. And so they they might be able to tell us things we quite answer questions we didn't even know we yeah, had. I yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that that's exactly it. It will just it pro- will probably see things we can't see, and that's the that'll be interesting. It'll be interesting, you know, how that affects us as <laughs> people. So you mentioned environmental data. What kind of information do you think we could use? Oh, this is what is worrying me because I think I think my job could be at risk here. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, I think you could just record data and have it straight talking to like a building management system. So you don't or... need to go there every Monday morning and download the, <laughs> the no, data no, and have a look no. at it and see if you're worrying about it or whatever. You can just no. the machine will just make all those decisions for you or make all the decisions for you. No more. <laughs> No more me. Do you think there are limitations with this? Do you think there are things that we're not going to be able to do with this sort of machine learning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the data is already, I guess, biased. It's biased to a certain extent. And it will mean you have to be creative. The creative side of humanity will, will be the thing that the machine can never learn. So that's... You know, that will be that will always be the limitation of it, and it will ne- it will never replace a conservator. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the hand skills required from a conservator require you know you do something, you have to think about what you've done and how you you know that affects your next decision and your next decision is based on your experience. I, I don't think a conservator is very safe. <laughs> do you think so? You don't think that decision making could be replaced by rational algorithms in the end, then or no? no. I, I I think it's um. D- We've got a cars exhibition coming up, and the curator went to the Dagenham Ford plant, mm. and he said at, at the height of it, I think they were employing something like it was like a mini city. I think, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's about more than about two hundred thousand people were employed there. Wow. Okay. You know, it was like a whole city. It was like a really insanely huge mm. plant, basically a big factory, and um, it's currently now whittled down to everything's been automated, so it's now been whittled down to a few thousand. Yeah, and, and they do really hand skilled jobs, like so the finishing of the cars, things that only a human can judge. You know what what quality is. You know, yeah. So that kind of hand skill work will always be. If, I don't think a machine can learn it. I, I think they're trying, but I, I don't think the the, the hand eye coordination, the interpretation. You know that that works. That doesn't work. I don't think mach- machines. The machine learning can never really imitate that. Yeah. And I guess a lot of conservation decisions are very dependent on context. So you might decide to do some retouching differently, depending on whether something's going into storage or whether it's going on in an exhibition. 
And it's that knowledge of what the context of the object is that helps you make those kinds of decisions. So I guess that might be hard to quantify. Yeah, and that, that, it, how, how do you quantify, you know, like, <laughs> what what looks good and what doesn't, you, yeah. you know? That... I don't know. Funnily enough, I'm more <laughs> sceptical than you about that. Are you? And I kind of, yeah, I kind of feel if you had enough examples of what people think looks good, <laughs> yeah, maybe. then possibly <laughs> there may be deep <laughs> patterns in there that we just don't recognise. Um, ah. So... I yeah I'm not as sure as you are that our jobs are safe but it's good to know you think they are. <laughs> no no I I think I think conservatives jobs are perfectly safe with uh, <laughs> in the modern world. <laughs> so you were also telling me earlier about another project that you've got on currently. Yes yeah so we're working I did some charity work um, and I was speaking to one of the people that came to the um, events and he's a student and he's doing computer science at Imperial College. And I was like, and I, was, and I was talking to him about this object I noticed at the V&A. It's a, it's a Jane painted cloth. It's very rare, and it can, it's very large as well, and it contains fourteen thousand hand painted numbers on it. Mm. And so, uh, and I'm a Jane, so do, do you know what Jainism is? Yes, it's a religion. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, it's a religion. And um, so we we're, were, were chatting, and we and, and it was really interesting because nobody really understands what the numbers mean and. So there's various theories. It could be um, to do with astronomical calculations, or you know. But but, but the quote on it is: "May this magical diagram bring victory, may it fulfil all desires of." And then there's a bit missing, and his family. Mm. <laughs> so, so I thought we, we were just chatting, and um, we thought, yeah, this is like a perfect machine learning problem. Yeah, it's a machine learning <laughs> and an artificial intelligence problem. <laughs> so the. There's sort of two issues with this painting. One is there's 14,000 numbers that need to be translated or transcribed. And with uh, machine learning, you can, let's say, take out all the ones, take out all the twos, take out all the threes, mm-hmm. and train it to actually start reading it by itself. Yeah. So that, that kind of work's been done already. And that's kind of like a, I wouldn't say a standard machine learning problem, but, you know, the kind of thing you can, you can do at home mm-hmm. sort of thing. And the second part was um, the actual artificial intelligence part, which is identifying any patterns in it and seeing if it matches any other data sets or, you know. Yeah. And we, we're just not, we're just hoping the last two numbers on it don't, don't, don't coincide with the Brexit vote and Donald Trump. Being <laughs> <it>. <laughs> and, Do you think it's all a giant prediction? <laughs> <we're not. laughs> but you do think it's likely to be meaningful then um that there is some sort of code in there it's not just nonsense honestly we 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 don't know we just just, at the moment it's just a bit of fun really yeah (laughs) and trying to learn how to do the coding parts as well and the machine learning and you know it's it's been quite nice and it's it's quite a nice community project so part of the charity we, we might offer it out to the community and say you know here's a chunk of the class can you can you type the numbers down or something for us? And, you know, it's just a nice little... You could get the community involved as well. So that kind of oh, thing. what, so actually um, distribute the work? So, like, crowd, oh, yeah, yeah, crowdsource yeah. the work, as it were. Right, so. Exactly, yeah. Oh, like, it's, that's it's, a great it's, idea. Because 40,000 numbers is quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm quite... Well, good luck with that. Um, I look forward to hearing whether it has predicted the Brexit yeah, vote. If it would be good news at the end. So have you got ideas for any other projects involving museum collections and data? Oh, uh, yeah. Like, um, I, I think there's lots of work to do with visualising data, environmental data, making it, making it presentable, mm-hmm. especially to senior management, making it in a way where it's, you know, it's, it's accessible for everybody. You know, it's not just tables or charts or, you know, something, something different, you know. I'm just wondering how, I mean, I know you said it's something people can learn to do and that there's a lot of support out there, but you did also say that you are a total geek and enjoy this kind of thing as well. So I'm just wondering if you can sort of envisage a way that museums can get started with these kinds of things if they don't have someone who's a total geek on the staff already or... Is is there any kind of network, do you know, for people using this kind of technology in museums or...? I, 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 I honestly don't know. I, I think I'm... Yeah, I've, I have felt a bit lonely in the museum world. I've got... 
I've got loads of coder friends, and a lot of my friends I made through coding are done through meetup events. So meet, meetups are a great place to start. Yeah. Probably shouldn't give away my secret, but a lot of these things are sponsored by the government, so they, or, or, or companies or big companies will pay for these big events. Yeah. So there generally tends to be free food and beer at these things. So ah, okay. Shouldn't, shouldn't <laughs> let that one go. <laughs> out there now so, good incentive okay <laughs> it, it, it's just really forming a little like a, a huddle you know a little little group of you mm. get together and just say you know i'm stuck with this and meeting the right meeting the right geek you know for one of a better phrase mm. the right team you're getting a little nice little team together it's it, it, it's just it's kind of well, once you're into it there's a lot of material out there you can just pick up and learn i, I think learning by example is probably the best way of learning this yeah, the p- potentials are endless. Yeah, really, really, there's some really great stuff out there. Cool. Well, Bav Shah, thank you very much for talking to The C Word today. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. I'm amazed by the textile project. That is, that the potential of that is absolutely fabulous. I like the idea of little little cameras for oh, pest, for the pest. monitoring know, because adorable. it's it's adorable <laughs> like but... a little traffic camera yeah, exactly <laughs> they had clear practical issues yes. so oh, early days, days. The camera early found days. it difficult to operate in low light and then like he said the insects don't like stop for a selfie every yeah. time they go past the camera <laughs> so you know there's, there's issues with that i think yeah. i i can see how if you can teach your neural networks to recognize particular insects that might speed up the identification bit when they're actually when you're actually going through your pest traps so rather than trying to use it to catch live insects i can see it might be quite helpful in saying okay what kind of insect is this i suppose yeah. i mean i suppose if you if you essentially could gather all of your pest traps and take a clear photo of them Exactly. And then have a computer just analyse all of the photos so that you ultimately end up with, in actual fact, you've got a growth spike in Death Watch Beetle. Uh, if it could do that, that's quite cool. I guess it depends on how many pest traps you're working with. Because ultimately, for me, that wouldn't really save any time, in no, my opinion. Yeah, yeah. However, if you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of them yes. because you're working across a massive museum site such as actually, the well, so yeah. works in the v <laughs> well yeah exactly exactly <laughs> then i can totally see how that would mm-hmm. actually be beneficial yeah. because yeah, you yeah. wouldn't have to do all that manually and you wouldn't have to put it into your spreadsheet and mm-hmm. then yeah. and then start like just kind of trying to see trends like because that is a time-consuming part yeah actually checking the traps is not the time-consuming part it's all of the analysis afterwards mm-hmm. yeah so i mean there's there's all sorts of room for improvement there mm-hmm. but Anyway, I noticed during us listening to this interview that your eyes glazed over slightly at machine learning. Now, you see, that is a, I've, I wrote down on my stupid questions list. <laughs> so everyone, in this safe space that we are in, what's machine learning? <laughs> Basically, instead of this sort of traditional idea of telling, of feeding all of your data into a machine and sort of telling it, giving it lots of information which it can then analyse and so on, it's a more kind of dynamic process where you use a certain type of network that can actually learn actively. So it can learn on the job. So you can give it examples of things and then it can start to find similarities, for example. Um, And then when you give it more and more data, it adds to that. It's sort of similar in the way to the way that humans learn things. So the way that you can learn to distinguish between an apple and a pear and an orange, for example, is by looking at lots of apples and starting to see, okay, well, apples look like this and pears are a slight slightly different shapes so generally pears are this kind of shape apples are this kind of shape so every time you see one you can start to every time you see one that adds to your experience and your knowledge and start you start to build up these sorts of personal data sets does that make sense this is a really terrible explanation i'm sure there's a much better one somewhere it does so does that mean that then you tell that you show it a photo of an apple and you go apple and then next time they'll they'll carry on yeah effectively but it can also it can be used so um there are examples people are talking about using this for example um in image processing in archives so if you have a very large archive of photos you can teach it to recognize particular people's faces what in fact machine learning is quite a lot facial recognition you know 
Oh, so facial recognition is one of the... Uh, okay, so I hadn't considered that you could apply that historically and then find... And it might suggest that you tag these photos in your archive with this person, for example, because it recognises... Or it might recognise a particular building in the background or something. So that's one way oh, people are talking cool. about using it in archives. Mm. Um, another way that it can be used is OCR, which is optical character recognition. So that's that's used very widely. Yes, because didn't... Oh, I swear there was something. Some very important persons uh, handwritten letters that are very difficult to decipher even mm-hmm. for human eyes who are very yeah. experienced <laughs> with this, that they've started having an AI look at that to recognise mm. more handwriting and actually decipher some of it because what? it can process vast amounts of information much faster than we can. And it can be, it can be used to, to scan documents and turn yes. them into text, for example, which might yeah. also be useful when you've got an archive of printed documents and you want to digitize them Mm. and here because we're talking about uh, essentially ai so artificial intelligence uh, i would just want to say that one of the ways that we're currently trying to supply transcriptions of our episodes is that we're feeding them into an ai run by a company Mm. called otter uh, and they are trying to interpret what we're saying so actually in a very meta way one day otter is going to look at this and see oh look they talked about me um (laughs) Anyway, so uh, basically it's trying to provide a transcript of the show and it tries to identify when different people are speaking, for example. Whoa. Um, And right now we've got a volunteer project. Thank you, volunteers. We love you. Thank you. Uh, Where where people are um, sorting through what it thinks that we're saying. So... Because it's not perfect, because Mm -hmm. as with anything, as listening to us, it might not understand our dialect or it might be confused by slurred speech Mm -hmm. or us laughing too much or because we're using a lot of jargon that it might not have come across before. Mm -hmm. So because it's usually used for meeting notes and minutes and that sort of thing. But in actual fact, we're feeding in a podcast, which is slightly different. Uh Yeah. And as the volunteers are editing this, the AI is learning. So as they're correcting things, it's seeing that, oh, I see, they're not saying paranoid, they're saying paraloid. Oh, I see, paraloid is a recognized <laughs> word. And also they're putting a capital P on that. That means it's a brand name. Okay, so the, whenever they say that next, I'm going to make sure that it says paraloid with a capital P in the text. So that's the kind of thing that it's learning all the time because our volunteers are teaching it that. So that's humans teaching an AI to improve what it's hearing and transcribing so technology is amazing is where what what i'm getting at (laughs) so i found a few examples of this kind of thing being used in museums although most of them are not in conservation but i do know of a couple in conservation which i'll talk about afterwards as well oh yeah most of them interestingly are to do with visitor experience interaction interpretation Mm -hmm. that kind of thing right so in the september issue of museums journal there's um, there's a page on trends watch every time and this one was about machine learning and how basically it's being used in museums so it mentioned things like the barbican's ai more than human exhibition and it it cites a couple of examples in here about uh, art created by ai for example like where we've got basically uh, ai analyzing loads of oil paintings uh, in the old styles and then it trying to create a new oil painting or something that looks like an oil painting so that it creates something that's inspired by everything that it's seen. And then people are, of course, debating about, well, is it art because it's made by a computer, not a human? So can they make art because it's not with an intent of being art? It's, you know, all this stuff. So we're getting really, Mm. really, like, philosophical about this. It was an interesting one-page little article about ways that the art world mostly is using Mm -hmm. AI and how some museums have been doing exhibitions on or about AI, basically. Uh, But Christina, I'm sure you have more. I've got some examples of where museums have been using robots and usually in the kind of visitor experience area. Mm -hmm. So the Smithsonian in 2018 um, had six little four foot tall humanoid robots, which were nicknamed Pepper. And they were there to answer visitors' questions, tell stories, that kind of thing. Um, They also, uh, the article I'm looking at says that they also dance, play games and pose for selfies. Um, That gives me the So they're there to interact with visitors to the museum. Okay, so um, there's also this thing called Dot, which is a chatbot digital tour guide, which you can download on your phone. And it's uh, apparently she has dark glasses and a pink 
um, little page boy haircut as well, which sounds quite cool. She can take you on a tour of the museum and discuss works of art, but also ask questions. And the whole idea is that um, she's there to kind of... It's like an intelligent conversation, so it's not just pre-programmed responses all the time, but she'll sort of respond to what you're saying and then ask follow-up questions and okay. give more information based on that as well. And they describe it as a sort of choose-your-own-adventure tour of the museum's collection because it's not a, a fixed tour oh, okay. route it That's depends on i don't know if you remember those choose your own adventure books yeah yeah absolutely um, that were around when i was a kid where it's kind of you you have to choose option a or b and go to a different page depending on what you choose yes uh, there's a museum in rio de janeiro as well that uses a chat bot for similar things which will ask you questions and give you information about the collections and so on so i found a couple of examples as well of what they call intelligent art critics oh god <laughs> one from the philadelphia bonds foundation so they can some of these museums have been using ai to um, go through images of paintings in their collection for example mm -hmm. and um, i found an example of a project at the tate so um, they had a project called recognition which paired similar images um, for people so for example there might be a modern photograph of a woman sitting in a chair in a particular pose and they would find a painting from the 16th century that had a very similar image and it was kind of pairing things up and suggesting that these paintings could be or these images could be linked together in a sort of interesting way. So it's kind of finding images of artworks yeah. in the collection and putting oh, them together I've noticed Google do that. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. that's not unlike what Google Well, so does. there was the Art Selfie app um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, which was only in the US, unfortunately, so I never yeah. got to use it. But that was encouraging visitors to take a selfie in a museum and then it would find from its database of artworks someone in a portrait that looked like you. Yeah, <laughs> or, I, I thought that was, that was really, really like clever. And pair it up. So uh, there was that. Um, the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris um, had a robot art critic called Berenson, which was named <laughs> after an actual famous art critic. Uh, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure he was. Around. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need to find a picture of this thing. It's like literally it's a humanoid robot wearing a bowler hat and an overcoat what? and a scarf. And um, it would trundle around the museum and it would look at the visitors who were looking at the artworks and um, it oh, was wow. trained to analyse their facial expressions and categorise them as positive oh or God. negative oh, while they wow. were looking at the artworks. And from this, it was starting to learn whether people liked a painting, were they smiling at it and looking happy and did they have positive body language or were they sort of looking frowning and looking as if they didn't like it. And based on that, for the paintings that it liked, it would smile, the robot would smile and move towards the artworks that it liked um, or it would frown or move away from the artworks that it didn't like which is quite a kind of crude form of criticism but you have to get the basics right before you can do anything more sophisticated are we in the future yes is this the future yes because that seems like <laughs> it's a just very a, like you saw the headline about jetpacks the other day <laughs> so i asked bav if he thought that our jobs were going to be taken over by robots in 10 years time and he was quite optimistic and felt that a lot of what conservators do apart from the very routine stuff can't be done by machines i'm actually quite a lot more pessimistic than he was but i'd be interested to oh, really? know what you two think i mean yeah, that, really. that, that makes me curious because i feel like conservators are not at risk of being replaced by robots and i say that because there's, there's so much hand skill and all that stuff and mm. so much stuff like that that goes into what we do and also a lot of stuff that's very inconvenient to have a robot do which sounds kind of shite when i express <laughs> it like that but like Think about where you have your most awkward pest trap. Like, if like robots aren't going to get in there, even if robots could technically trundle around the galleries and possibly hoover up <laughs> your your pest traps, for example, like and then analyze them, it's not like it's going to get into the crawl space behind three exhibits. And like, you know, that's that's a you job. <laughs> that's a you job. They'll probably go on strike for better conditions rather than. The <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think I feel positive about this sort of thing, freeing up the grunt work, as you put it, Christina, freeing up mm. conservator time for bench work, the important admin that goes with it, that kind of thing. 
because obviously we have to split our time to do this sort of thing as well. But what I don't, mm. I, what I don't feel optimistic about is the money saving necessity. I'm putting that in quote marks in museums to say, well, okay, then you can get as much, just as much practical bench work done with one person. Now you've got this computer to do it. The now you've got this computer bits. to do the other bits, so we don't need two people. So I, I don't feel particularly optimistic with this as a, a leading to more conservation work being done. I mean, that, that's that's an interesting angle that I hadn't really considered, that, yeah, maybe, maybe that's where it's going instead. Well, your robot can work 24 hours a day and 365 days a year, so there will come a point where it possibly is cheaper to have your robot conserving objects for display or whatever. Ah, but it won't be doing the conservation work, though, will it? Because, like, that's like... Why not? It won't be making the ethical judgment. I, th- I think <laughs> the we we like to think that we are bringing our unique knowledge and experience and that this is something that can only be done by a skilled human. But I also think that there are deep patterns underlying these sorts of things that could be recorded and could be learnt from. And you probably could teach a robot to make the same kind of judgments. No, I think the skilled handwork and that sort of thing, that still needs to be a, a human because I don't think that we can build a robot that's good Why? enough. We can't build a robot that's good enough. There are robots that do surgery in like, the NHS. Very specifically. <laughs> they have to be programmed very delicately to do that. And by which I mean like, yes, yeah, so you might be able to have one robot that does a specific kind of ceramic restoration, like on a specific type of ceramic. Like you wouldn't have a ceramic conservative robot that would then do all of these different types of ceramic things and do all of these different types of treatments. So then you would have to suddenly invest in like a very hyper specialized robot per possible problem. I think I just don't think that they will be able to really? get. Why? Why not? I just don't think they'll get. I mean, the whole point of these systems is that they're able to learn different according to different situations and so you just feed it more and more and more data about different types of ceramics and just like a human it will be able to diversify but that's assuming that the kind of ai intelligence will match its like its components i think it might have that knowledge because that's the easy thing to absorb but i don't think that they'll make a versatile enough robot that it can actually perform all of those tasks and then you'd have to have a series of robots that perform them and possibly share one brain do you think the limitations are to do with intelligence or do you think the limitations are to do with the physical capabilities of the robot i think it's about the physical capabilities personally because i think there's every possibility that they can aside from the fact that we I, we don't know how to teach them ethics maybe is that they can probably pick up the skills in terms of a, a learning kind of way but then you would also have have to have the robot understand like when something feels wrong you stop like, mm-hmm. i think those are the kinds of things that will be the difficulty and probably the limiting factor to be honest well there's another limiting factor in uh, referencing the start of the episode that if we can only piggyback onto other commercial areas environmental monitoring systems mm. because nobody cares enough to make museum specific ones we're definitely only going to be able to piggyback onto other commercial areas ai robots at which because point, no one's going to care enough. The closest one will be surgery, which is actually very different yeah. from, <laughs> yeah. from conservation. And yeah, yeah. I just don't think anyone's going to bother with that. <laughs> we, in some ways, we're not important enough, which is fine. <laughs> And also, let's be fair, like the surgery ones, I mean, a lot of that is like really high stress situations. And whilst whilst people will often ask me, do you, do you not feel very stressed when you're working on something that's really oh, yeah, fragile, no. <laughs> which is sometimes accurate. I was like, yeah, but no one's going to die yeah, if I mess Yeah, there's a reason I'm not up. a surgeon. So in actual fact, that's not a significant psychological load. I wouldn't be a conservator if I, if I didn't enjoy the thrill <laughs> of thinking that, yeah. Let's see how this goes today. Uh, that's not how a doctor feels. That's true. And I mean, <laughs> conservation is not brain surgery, yeah. in fact. I'd just like to say I don't think the ethics that most people learn or apply in their practice are that sophisticated either. And I think that the ethical analysis could easily be learnt by a robot. But I take your point about the, the physical hand skills side of it. And ironically, that's where a lot of people are saying that conservators are starting to lose their skills, <laughs> funnily enough, because we're being called on to do so many other things. So it'd be interesting if in future the robots do all the other things all the kind of really boring monitoring and logging and mixing up stuff and so on and the conservators some people like end up that. doing more oh yeah that's true well then let them but 
my God. <laughs> it would be interesting if that actually freed up a lot of conservators to go back to doing more bench work, in fact, and rediscovering those highly refined skills. Can I just make a shout out to Spike Bucklow at the Hamilton Car Institute, who was interested in this stuff possibly earlier than anybody I've ever come across in conservation. So his PhD um, thesis in I think 1996, ooh, ooh. was about the classification of craquelure patterns. So craquelure is the kind of characteristic cracking of the varnish and paint layers that you get in many old master paintings, uh, which is why yes. the that sort of cracked surface. And different paintings have different craquelure patterns, and Spike was interested to know whether that could be used as a way of looking at the origin of the paintings, um, their geographical and temporal origins as well and he actually did an analysis of this using artificial intelligence and found in fact yes you can find common crack patterns and this is something which is much better done by a machine because they're much better at spotting these kinds of patterns that might not that are statistically significant but they might not be so obvious to somebody who's just looking at them visually Mm. If you see what I mean, machines are much better at finding these underlying patterns, even when they're not so obvious to us. Um, And so he's somebody who's been interested in this stuff for a very long time, um, for more than 20 years. And I had I remember having a conversation with him about uh, 10 years ago about dust monitoring. Uh huh also likewise and about um, using machines to look at sort of dust levels in museums to analyze where the dust falls and so on but also looking at how much dust you can have on an object before it starts to become visually bothersome (laughs) almost (laughs) as well so yeah really spike was ahead of his field and is i'd I'd love to know whether he's um, working on anything like this at the moment I I should just say as well that image processing is a massive thing in medicine and I wonder if there are applications for conservation there. Oh, there I think absolutely, absolutely. So there are intelligent systems, if you like, artificial intelligent systems that are much better at analysing, for example, scan images for possible tumours and they perform much better than humans do at this. Although, to be honest, I also heard something that said that they taught pigeons to look at these pictures and they also performed better than (laughs) surgeons did as well so you know it doesn't (laughs) it may just be that humans are actually really crap at looking at patterns in images but i'm wondering if um likewise you can use neural networks to start to analyze pictures of objects for um cracks and areas of damage and that kind of thing so i just want to put that out there as a possible Mm. future direction in conservation interesting Right, well, if that's your daily dose of philosophical stuff, and uh, we will leave you with loads of food for thought, I hope. Dear Jane, is applying for and doing a PhD just a great big gamble? Why? Dear why? Thank you for your question. So, PhDs, a great big gamble. Well... On the one hand, they certainly represent a degree of uncertainty. You don't know when you start out on them, where they're going to take you. It's almost definite that during the course of your PhD research, you're going to experience some changes in your plan. And you probably don't have a job lined up that requires that PhD. Certainly looking from the employability data, it's not a critical factor in getting a conservation job in many countries. But that doesn't necessarily mean that taking a PhD is is an impossible gamble. And I think the reason why I think that is that I think any decision that you make about your career, whether it's to take a job, go for something that earns more money, do an internship, get experience, work with someone that you've always admired, all of those things you embark upon as a journey without really having any guarantees where you'll be at the end of it. And so really, when you think about your career, all you can really do is take steps forward in directions that make sense to you. So whether it's an internship, a job or a PhD, they're all something of a gamble, but they're not really because you've really got to do something with your life. And so I think the more important question when you're choosing a PhD is, is this something I'm going to enjoy? Is this something I got a sense of fulfillment from? Is this something I can afford to do? Am I making any unreasonable compromises in my life? You know, you don't want to be living in absolute penury. But if it's something that you're interested in, think something that you think will stimulate you and something that will give you a valuable life experience, it will be three or four years of your life that you'll be glad when you look back on that you've done something of value that you can see what you were doing it from, then I really don't think it is a gamble. 
you don't know how it's going to affect your future life, but you can assume, you can decide that it's the right path for you. And on that basis, I think it's no more of a gamble than any other choice. And as with everything, I always say was, you know, follow your heart and your intellect. And I think that is the best way to go forward in life. Over and out. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. And welcome to our latest patron, Alex. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. We're The C Word and you've been listening to Christina Rosaic, Chloe Rumsey and me, Jenny Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about diversity. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at The C Word Podcast or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. And I, for one, yep. welcome our robot overlord <laughs> in museums. Very nice. <laughs>